This is a prototype refreshable braille display using an array of solenoids with three rows and two columns to automatically raise and lower the dots in a single braille character cell. Refreshable braille displays are very expensive, so this prototype using an Arduino to control the solenoids is a great way to demonstrate how you can make this technology cheaper and more accessible. In the rest of this video, we'll go over the circuit and example code so you can build your own. First, let's take a close-up look at one of the solenoids. Now, these are push-pull solenoids, meaning they can both push and pull. A solenoid is an electromagnet coiled around a ferromagnetic core, and in this case, when you run current through the solenoid, it is going to push that little pin out. However, it also has a spring on the back here that gets compressed when that pin pushes out, so when you stop the current flowing through the electromagnet, that spring is going to expand again and pull the pin back in. So again, when you apply current, it pushes this side out, stop the current, that side pulls back in, so that is what allows you to raise and lower the dots on your braille display. This dot, or little pin here itself, may not be the best tactile option for a physical display, so in this video I'm just going to be talking about the electronics and the code to make this work. When you are thinking about building your display, you might want to think about something like plastic or wooden beads that are a little more rounded and smooth that you could mount on these pins to make a display that's easier to read for the user's fingers and not something they will snag on since this doesn't really have nice rounded edges. These solenoids also have pretty thin flexible wires that are difficult to push into a breadboard. So as you saw in the wider shot, I am using these plastic spring clips after stripping a little bit of insulation off the wires, connecting the wires from the solenoid to one side and then a solid core jumper wire to the other side, which is easier to connect to the breadboard. Looking at the breadboard, this is a little messy, so we're going to switch over to the computer for a cleaner view, but first a high level overview of the components. The solenoids require more current than an Arduino pin can provide directly, so we need transistors. These are N-channel MOSFETs to drive the solenoids from an external power source. These are 12-volt solenoids, so I have a separate external 12-volt power supply that is powering the solenoids, and again, I'll talk about how to wire that and use an Arduino with external power. I also have an optional button here. You can write the program to cycle through the characters at a fixed rate, like once per second, which is what I was doing in the demonstration. You can also edit the code to wait for a button press, so the user has to press this button before advancing to the next character. We also have flyback diodes on the breadboard here, one for each transistor. These are needed because rapidly turning solenoids on and off can result in voltage spikes that can damage more sensitive electronics like microcontrollers and transistors, so you don't really need to worry about the electrical engineering behind it. Just take my word for it that these diodes help suppress that voltage spike and avoid damaging some of the other more fragile components in your circuit. So again, we are going to switch over to the computer in a minute and take a look at this wiring diagram in a cleaner, more close-up view. A quick note before we do that, the advantages of using solenoids for a project like this are that they are cheap and very easy to use and set up if you are new to Arduino. The big disadvantage is that they require a lot of current and they can get pretty hot if you leave them on for a long period of time. So this block of solenoids will get warm or even hot to the touch if you leave a static display with a single character just on for a long time. So again, this works well as a demonstration for a science fair where you are cycling through characters and can have long periods of off time, you wouldn't want to use this as something like a static sign on a wall that is just on with the same text for hours at a time or all day because it's going to get very hot. So again, this works as a proof of concept or a prototype. In terms of practical implementation for long-term use, it would require a lot of power and get pretty warm. There are other ways to do this using different actuators or something called a bi-stable mechanism that is stable either in the raised or lowered position and doesn't require continuous power application to stay there. It only requires power to switch between the two states. So there's some more information about those options if you check out the written instructions on our website linked in the description of this video if you want to try something that's a little more practical and lower power consumption and won't get as hot. But again, for demonstration or prototype purposes, these solenoids are just fine. As promised, let's switch over to the computer and take a look at a cleaner version of the circuit diagram. Now, don't worry if this seems overwhelming. 
It is basically six copies of the same thing, one for each solenoid. I will also note that the simulation program I am using here called Tinkercad, which we have a separate tutorial about in our Arduino playlist linked in the description, does not actually have a parts option for solenoids. So I am using these little vibration motors, which also have two wires and the circuit to control them is effectively the same. So again, in your physical project you build, these are going to be solenoids. In the simulation I'm doing here, I am representing them with vibration motors. If this does look too overwhelming because there are too many wires, we do have a tutorial about using a single solenoid in our Arduino tutorial playlist, which again, you can find linked in the video description. So if you wanna check that out and learn how to use a single solenoid first before you jump up to using an array of six of them, that is fine. You can go check that video out first and then come back to this one. Now let's zoom in a little closer and look at how all of the components are wired. We have a push button straddling the middle gap of the breadboard. One side of the button has an external 10 kilo ohm pull down resistor going to ground. It also has a wire going to Arduino pin eight. The other side of the button has a wire directly going to the power bus, which is in turn connected to five volts from the Arduino. So this is configured such that this input pin will be low by default, thanks to the pull down resistor, and it will go high when you push the button. In our Arduino tutorial playlist, we also have a video just about buttons if you would like to go watch that first if you've never used one before. Next up, we have the first one of our transistors. Now, I'm not really gonna get too deep into transistors and the electrical engineering behind them in this video. This is a specific type called an N-channel MOSFET. So that's what NMOS stands for here. Commonly used for controlling things like motors using an Arduino. You can think of it like an electronic control valve. So you'll notice it has three pins. It has a control pin that you connect to one of the Arduino pins. That pin does not really draw any power. And then the other two pins allow you to control power flow from a larger external power supply through something like a motor or a solenoid. So it allows you to control a higher power load using your low power Arduino pins that cannot provide enough current to drive that load directly. Each MOSFET has three pins, the gate, G, drain, D, and source, S. So those are labeled with letters for us here in Tinkercad. They will probably not be labeled on a physical MOSFET that you purchase. So you will need to look at the data sheet for your MOSFET to make sure that you have the right pins. It might not match what I have in this diagram here. So starting with the gate, again, that is the control pin that is connected to one of the digital pins on the Arduino. I'm gonna skip the drain for now because that's a little more complicated. The source pin, which is the third pin, which would be over on the right if you were viewing this from the front like this, that is going to be connected to ground. So again, gate pin connected to an Arduino pin, source pin connected to ground. The drain pin has two connections. One of them is the flyback diode. Again, this is the part that helps prevent voltage spikes from turning the inductor on and off rapidly from damaging the rest of your circuit. That is connected over to the positive power supply for the motors, which is 12 volts, not, sorry, solenoids, not motors, which is 12 volts from the external power supply, not five volts from the Arduino. And diodes are directional. They only allow current to flow in one direction. So you wanna make sure the stripe on the diode is connected to that positive 12 volts and not directly to the drain pin. The drain pin is also connected to the negative wire from your solenoids. So again, I'm using these vibration motors to represent the solenoids here. And you can see I have the black or negative wire from the motor connected down here to the drain pin. The positive wire of the motor is also connected to my right side power bus here, which I have connected to my external power supply that is going to provide my 12 volts. What this allows, and again, this is just a high level overview of how this works, is for power from your bigger power supply that again, your Arduino cannot provide enough of to flow from the power supply through the motor or solenoid down through the MOSFET in the drain pin and out the source pin to ground without ever needing that power to actually flow out of your Arduino's pin. So again, the idea here is that 
trying to drive one of these motors or solenoids directly with an Arduino pin would not work. They can only provide enough current to do something like an LED, but not a motor or solenoid. So the MOSFET allows you to use an external power supply. And again, we have some more tutorials about this and controlling other things like motors and using a variety of external power supplies with your Arduino in our Arduino tutorial playlist linked in the description of this video. So that was a walkthrough of just one of the MOSFETs. And then we have five copies of the same thing. So each one of these has those same connections. So I'm not going to go over them all one at a time. I am going to go over the power connections though, because this is important to avoid damaging your Arduino. It is important for your entire circuit to have a common ground. So you will notice that I have the ground bus on this side of the breadboard connected to the ground pin on the Arduino. Then there is a jumper wire connecting it to the ground bus on the other side of the breadboard, which is then connected to the negative terminal of the power supply. However, since we have two different positive voltages, you do not want to connect your power buses. I have five volts from the Arduino going to the left side power bus over here, and I have 12 volts from my external power supply going to the right side power bus over here, and that is what is powering my solenoids. Do not connect those or you will short circuit 12 volts directly to the five volts on your Arduino and potentially damage your Arduino. So you do not want a jumper wire like this connecting those power buses. You want to keep those separate. Now let's take a look at the code. The general idea here is that we want to take a string of letters and reproduce it one character at a time using the solenoids as an adaptable braille display. So each letter or cell in the braille alphabet has six dots or bumps in two columns labeled like this. We have bumps one, two, three, and then four, five, six. Each letter in the English alphabet, A through Z, is represented by a specific order of raised and lowered bumps. So for example, the letter A, the first bump is raised, represented by a one here, and the other five are lowered, represented by zeros. So we are storing all of this data in an array. So we have a row of the array for each letter, and then the columns of the array represent our dots one through six. Next up, we have a bunch of variable declarations. We have an array storing the Arduino pin numbers of the control pins that we are going to use to control the solenoids. We have one for the button pin, and then going a little out of order here, we have a string variable for the text that you want to convert to Braille. We also have an array that stores the alphabet of lowercase letters, A through Z. We are going to use that to look up the index of each letter in the alphabet from the word that we want to convert to Braille. And then in turn, we will use that index to look up the appropriate row of this array to decide which solenoids to turn on and off. So we'll get into that logic in a little bit. We have a variable to get one letter at a time from the string that you want to convert to Braille, and then I get a variable for the index of that letter in the alphabet. Finally, we have a variable to get the length of the string that you want to convert to Braille, so we know how long this is before we cycle back through to the first letter. In the setup function, we initialize serial communication, which is always useful for debugging. We then use a for loop to set all of the control pins as output. So this is the advantage of storing those control pins in an array instead of as six separate integer variables. So we don't need six different pin mode commands. We only need one inside this for loop to loop through all of them. We then have a separate line to set the button pin as an input. In our loop function, we then have a for loop that goes through our text string and grabs each letter of it one at a time. So for example, if our text string is hello, the first thing it is going to do there is grab the letter H. There is then another nested for loop that goes through our alphabet array one letter at a time to find the index of that letter. So it is going to go through the alphabet and find the index 
where that letter is located. And note that arrays, the index starts at zero. So A is at index zero, B is at index one, and so on. Once we know that index, this is where, again, the serial printing comes in ha handy for debugging. We're going to print out the letter and the index. Now we know that index so we can find the proper row of our array that we have, where we have all of our Braille letter codes stored. So, for example, H is here, and we're going to have pins on, on, off, off, on, and off. So we look up that correct row. And then again, we had another for loop where we are going to loop through each column of the array to set the appropriate pin. So this loop is making clever use of how we have things stored in arrays. So we only need one digital write command instead of six separate digital write commands, one for each pin. Again, we're looping through, setting the appropriate control pin. We're going through pins we have six of them, one through six, but again, the array index starts at zero, so this actually goes zero through five. And then we are going through the columns of the appropriate row of the Braille array index. So for example, H, again, we would go through this row, one column at a time, setting each pin high or low. We finally then have this while digital read button pin equals low loop that is just empty there's no code in it so that is effectively going to act as a wait function that tells the code just get stuck here until the user pushes the button and this pin goes high at which point we will have one extra one second delay which functions as a software debounce to prevent accidentally reading multiple button pushes if you hold the button down briefly we will then go back to the top of the loop and go on to the next letter so if we run the simulation and see what happens here, we should see that on the serial monitor, it prints out the first letter of our string that's being converted to Braille, that is H. It also prints out the index of H in the alphabet. So we count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Again, remember that we start counting at 0. So H is at index 7. It is then going to turn on the appropriate pins, and in this case, vibrate the motors, but again, with the physical thing you're building, it would be moving the solenoid pins to correspond to the letter H. So if we go up and look up the row for H in this array, remember that the columns go, or sorry, the pin numbers go one, two, three, four, five, six, down the two columns. So for H, we will see that pin one is on, pin two is on, pin three is off, pin four is off, pin five is on and pin six is off. So with the solenoids and those bumps, these would just be statically raised, giving the braille letter H. If we click the button, we should advance to the next character in our string, which in this case is E in the word hello. So we're gonna go through the same process of looking up the index of that letter in the alphabet and then looking up the corresponding row in our braille array and setting the appropriate pins high and low to display the letter E. And if we keep clicking the button, we will keep cycling through each letter one at a time. If you just want it to cycle through the letters automatically at certain intervals, you can comment out this line with the while loop and then it will do it without waiting for the button press. So there you go, that was an overview of the circuit and code required to get this working. Again, what I did not cover in this video is any sort of physical enclosure where for example, you could mount the front face of these solenoids to the back of even just a piece of cardboard cardboard for the sake of a prototype or a thin piece of wood, and then maybe put some wooden or plastic beads on these pins so you have a nice smooth surface with little rounded bumps that get raised up when these activate. But coming up with that design is going to be up to you if you decide to try this project out. Remember that you can find a link in the description with the entire parts list, circuit diagram, and example code along with written instructions on our website. For many more Arduino projects and over a thousand other projects in all areas of science and engineering, check out the rest of our YouTube channel and our website, www.sciencebuddies.org.